What's going on, everybody? I'm Zach Peter, and welcome on into Book Club. Tonight, we are going to be breaking down Meghan Markle's, or sorry, not Meghan Markle's book, but the expose on Meghan Markle by Tom Bauer. It's called Revenge. I hope you have your copy ready. If you don't, I hope you have your notebook handy. Are we ready? Let's get it, get it, get it. Oh, hi, it's me, Zach Peter, pop culture junkie, reality TV insider, published author, and host of the No Filter with Zach Peter podcast. Here I'll bring you all the latest news on The Real Housewives, deep dives into celebrity legal scandals, and unfiltered combos with your favorite stars. I've got you covered. And yes, I always keep receipts. So be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for all the latest tea. Now, let's dive in. What's going on, everybody? Hello, hello, hello. I hope you have your copy of Revenge handy. So if you are in the U.S., the book doesn't officially go on sale until October. However, you can get a Kindle version or you can get an audio version. We will be breaking it down tonight. Hi, Robin, Ben. I'm going to give a shout out to everybody that is a member of the Zach Pack community. If you guys signed up, for our exclusive memberships. It's $2.99 a month, and there are going to be vlogs, exclusive tea that's going to be spilled, live streams. Are We know we always do fun after parties. Well, we're going to be doing live streams with the after parties that'll be exclusive to members only. We'll be doing our first one this Thursday, members only. After we go live on Thursday, we'll do our first members only after party. So get ready for that. If you're watching this on Instagram, you can sign up at youtube.com slash just plain Zach. And let me give you guys a few shout outs. Angela Woodham is a member. What's going on, Angela? Angela's calling or Angela's watching from Florida. We have Robin Ben also from Florida, who's a member. Sarah Bahu. Woo woo. Sarah Bahu's calling from Houston, Texas. We have Candy Pants, who's one of our newest members that just joined today and is already coming on into Book Club Live. Guys, I hope you are ready. Hi, Erica Cooper on Instagram. Hi, Holly. Okay, Megan exposed for what? We'll get into it. We will get into it. Ooh, Rock and Boho Co. Calling it or watching in from Nashville. Hello from the UK. Hi, Foxy Eva. All right, guys. Shall we get into this? Because there's a lot. It's a lot we're going to have to break down. So the book is called Revenge, Megan, Harry, and the War Between the Windsors. It is written by Tom Bauer. Who is Tom Bauer? Ooh, Annika. Annika is a new member of the Zach Pack. Just joined in. Russ Davis is a member of the Zach Pack. Joe Mendoza is a member of the Zach Pack. Guys, get that membership. It's only $2.99 a month. Like, that's that's... Like less than that's like three coffees that I could buy here in LA. Um, okay, so who is Tom Bauer, the author of this book, right? So Tom Bauer, he's a best-selling author. He's written over 25 books, including Revenge, but he's also written uh Rebel Prince, which I believe is about Prince Charles, who's now become King Charles the Third. He also wrote Broken Dreams. He wrote um another revenge book about Simon Cowell. So he's really good at doing like these expose type books. Clearly, if he's already published 25 of them and he's a best-selling author, right? He has a BBC, uh, he's a, a journalist on BBC and he's a TV producer. And over in the UK, he's considered Great Britain's best investigative journalist, okay? He pops the lid off of all these celebs, off of all of these scandals. And he always makes sure to spill the tea with facts, with um, testimonies, interviews. And so we get into the book and a lot of people are interviewed. Megan's parents are interviewed. Childhood friends are interviewed. Some of her adult friends are interviewed. Her agent, I believe, is interviewed. Like a lot of people in these first five chapters that we'll be breaking down today are speaking out about their experience with Megan or just at least their recollection and how it compares to some of the things that Megan has revealed in the press more recently. I will preface and warn you, if you are a fan of Meghan Markle, you might not be a fan of this book, okay? Because he doesn't hold back, and he's literally like, this is what Megan says, these are the interviews that Megan has given, and these are the, the claims that Megan has made. However, this is the information that I dug up from her teachers, from her professors, from her friends, from her mom, from her dad. 
these are the things that other people are saying, and these stories don't necessarily match up. So if you're a Meghan Markle fan, you might not be a fan of this book. But I'm telling you now, it's actually kind of juicy. Okay, chapter one. Chapter one is titled Thomas, and this is the chapter about Meghan's parents. Thomas is Meghan's father. So I... It's interesting that we called the book or that we titled the the chapter Thomas because we get into both Thomas and her mother Daria. Sorry, Doria. So her father Thomas, he was a bit of a party boy in his younger days, but ultimately, you know, he set his sights on Hollywood. This is where he went and he met the love of his life, well not really the love of his life, but at least his next baby mama, right? This is where he meets Doria. Doria is an inspiring uh, aspiring makeup artists. They meet on set together. They have one daughter and that daughter is Rachel Megan Markle. But eventually they end up dropping the Rachel soon because he always wanted to call her Megan. He wanted to name her Megan. Dory wanted to name her Rachel. And ultimately they just decided they were going to go with Megan because Megan fit her a little bit better, I guess. I don't know. Um, her father was enamored with her though. This was his baby girl. He loved her. He showered her in gifts. He gave her unconditional love. He spoiled her. He wanted to make sure that she was very well taken care of. And he did have two children prior, but he didn't at the time have the financial means to really be able to give them the life that he was now able to afford and provide for Megan. So his oldest daughter or older daughter, well, he only has three kids. So yeah, this would be his oldest daughter, Samantha. She didn't really seem to get along with Doria, who at this point would be her stepmother. And it seems like there's a little bit of resentment with Megan in, in what I was reading. So I don't know what their relationship is, but it doesn't appear that they are all that close. I kind of got the impression that Thomas Jr., which is Thomas's son, and Samantha, who are his two oldest kids, they kind of resented the fact that Megan was able to get a better life, um, that they that contrasted the life that they had or the upbringing that they were raised with, right? But both Thomas and Doria came from simple means. Doria struggled even more coming up as a woman of color here in America. The book clarifies, though, that they never really raised Megan to see herself as black or as white, that race just wasn't really a topic of conversation that they, you know, they wanted her to, you know, come into her own without having, um, I don't know if bias is the right word or, you know, without feeling like she has to identify as one or the other or one more than the other. They were like, you know, you're a beautiful little girl and we want you to be you and know that you have two parents that love you. And they always made sure that she was in an environment that was very inclusive. Um, they were in Los Angeles. So it, it, they said that there weren't a lot of instances that they recall of direct racism that was around Megan. They lived in a nicer part. They lived in the Hollywood Hills, which I guess was a better place, which they decided it was a better place to, res to raise Megan. Her mother, Doria, only recalls one instance where someone thought that Doria was Megan's nanny, not her mother. And apparently Doria was like, that was one of the few instances that I remember experiencing like some sort of, you know, prejudice or discrimination for, you know, being a black woman and having a daughter that had lighter skin. However, Megan wrote in 2015 about her life being biracial, and she wrote very fondly of how mindful her father was, even giving her a family set of dolls that he got just for her. And the set had a white father and it had a black mother. And the the daughter that was supposed to be her was seemingly mixed. So, you know, she felt seen and represented. Her childhood best friend said that she always knew that Megan had her sights on being famous. She grew up in Hollywood um, on set because, as I said, her father was um, he was a lighting technician or I think he became ultimately ended up being like a really um, famous lighting director. So he would make sure all of the scenes on set were lit very well. And then the mom, she was an aspiring makeup artist. And then it's kind of unclear why she never really pursued makeup. And then at some point she ends up like starting her own business. So at least with her father, she was very much always around him and on set. So she would often announce herself as she walked into a room and her friends describe her as very self-assured, which I mean, when you're, you know, a young girl, you're raised in Hollywood, you're raised on set, you see all these beautiful actresses, like that's not a far stretch, but it definitely seems like Megan and everybody around Megan very much knew that she was going to be famous one way or another, that she was going to pursue a career in Hollywood one way or another. Then we get into chapter two and chapter school is titled 
chapter two is titled school. So at nine years old, Doria decides that she wants to start a business of her own, which had her traveling often because I think she had to go to like different conferences and expos and, and try to promote her business. And this is where um, this left her to spend, this left Megan more time to spend on set with her father. So from what people on set describe of her, she was definitely a ham. She loved the camera. She had a dream of becoming a Hollywood star and she was quite popular on set. Like everybody loved her. I mean, when you're a cute little girl and you're bopping around and you're like, I'm going to be famous one day, then like, yeah, obviously, you know, you're going to steal the attention and people are going to think you're a cutie patootie. But she also grew up admiring Princess Diana and even impersonating Princess Diana uh, around her friends, which, you know, is interesting knowing that she ends up later marrying Prince Harry. So her friends say that her parents' divorce, however, didn't really seem to impact her as much as it had other kids, that the divorce that Megan was very understanding. A lot of people actually describe Megan in the book as very empathetic and, you know, very compassionate, I guess, is, is a term that maybe wasn't used, but that I, you know, would used to sum up some of the things that I read and some of the, um, the, the interviews that people gave about her. But she adapted very easily to her parents' separation, very empathetic to both parents. Her father, Thomas, was very protective of her. And so there's a story in the book where uh, we, the LA riots, when those began, he immediately took Megan out of Los Angeles and they went to stay for a few days out in Palm Springs until things died down. Her mother, Doria, ended up staying behind here in Los Angeles, saying that she felt safe and she didn't feel like there was really a need to leave Los Angeles. But Thomas didn't want Megan exposed to like scene violence at such a young age. I guess he didn't think that she really understood what was going on. And like, you know, kids, you kind of want to shelter from, you know, the heavy news, right? I remember when I was here in downtown LA when the George Floyd uh, protests and riots were happening and it was hit very hard here in downtown LA. And I live very close to the courthouse um, or to city hall rather. And I remember leaving my apartment and being like, okay, this uh, I'll come back in a couple of days once things kind of settle down because it was very chaotic that I couldn't imagine, you know, having a, a young child seen all of these things or even seen them on the news or having kids talk about it at school. Like I understand his desire to want to make sure that she, you know, wasn't exposed to, to any of that being so young and not fully understanding it. But he and Megan eventually returned to LA five days later. However, 20 years after all of this goes down, she described a very different experience saying that she remembers having to rush home because of the curfews. And she remembers seeing people with bags and just kind of throwing their stuff in bags um, as they were looting stores. And she remembers seeing men walking around holding rifles. She also like guns and rifles as part of like the looters and rioters is what she was referring to. She also claims that she remembers that there was a tree outside of her father's house. And she remembers seeing it charred from the fires However, it doesn't actually appear that her father lived anywhere near any of the damage from any of the riots took place. Um, and then five years after that, Megan told Variety that she remembers seeing Ash come down outside, you know, with her mother. And she remembers looking out the window and thinking that all of the ash was snow. And her mother was like, no, that's not snow. And it was ash from all the fires and from everything burning. Her father, however, claims that Megan never saw Doria during the riots because the first day that everything started to go down, as soon as Megan got home from school, he drove them straight to Palm Springs. Doria was obviously invited and she declined. She was going to stay back, but she had no exposure to any of these things, at least according to Thomas. And even when you look at where Thomas lived in comparison to where the riots were going on very strongly, like it didn't appear that there would be a charred tree outside of his home or even on their street. Um, but Megan's also spoken about an incident that impacted her terribly after, you know, she remembers witnessing her mother get into an argument on the road with a white driver who she claims yelled racial obscenities at, at Doria, but it didn't appear that she's ever really spoken about any major experiences as a child or even as a teen rather facing or witnessing any sort of racism or discrimination towards herself 
directly aside from that one incident that she's spoken about publicly. And then when it came to school, she went to a very diverse private Catholic school here in Los Angeles. The staff at her school even said that they thought that Megan was actually Italian and they didn't realize she was mixed initially. Um, Part of it had to do with the fact that her mother didn't go to the school very often. So I don't think it was very well known that her mother was black. Megan has also recently recounted um, an incident when she was about 12 years old in school saying that she felt torn when, you know, there was a student survey and she had to mark what her ethnicity was. And she said that she was unsure whether or not to choose Caucasian or whether to choose black. And she says that she remembers her teacher telling her, well, just choose Caucasian since that's what you look like the most. And she said that it felt like such a betrayal to her mother because her mother's black and how can she only choose one part of her and not both parts of her. And she says that she went home and she told her father about this incident. And she claims that her father told her that, you know, don't, you know, just like if that ever, if something like that ever happens again, then you go ahead and you draw your own box on that paper and you let them know that you can't be defined by one of their boxes. You're one of a kind, you know, so it seems like he was very reassuring of a lot of these things. Um, in school, she seemed to be quite the activist and she, the people that went to school with her described her as very well liked in high school. Um, she was also pretty popular. She was crowned homecoming queen. She was crowned class president. But years later, Megan claims that she grew up as more of an underdog and that she wasn't well liked because people thought that she was fake. But accounts from her former classmates say otherwise. So she said that her school was riddled with cliques. You had the white girls and you had the black girls and you had the Hispanic girls and she didn't really know where she fit in. So she says that part of the reason she took part in all of these extracurricular activities was so that she wouldn't have to eat lunch alone. She also recounts that she had to work at a yogurt shop in high school and that she only made $4 an hour and had to live off of the $4.99 uh, Sizzler salad bar, which is something her father also disputes. Her father says that she had a very high or that he had a very high salary, rather, that there was no need for her to ever have to work while she was in high school and that he would never allow her to work in high school because he wanted her to focus on his, on her studies. And he says that he also doesn't remember anything about a Sizzler salad bar and that she was very well taken care of. He's like, I don't know why she would talk about a Sizzler salad bar. She loved tacos. I made sure she had farm fresh food. Like she was very well taken care of. I provided for my family. I made a very good salary. I was very good at, you know, being present and I'm being a provider. And he's like, I don't know why she would say these things, but these don't check out with what I remember of, of growing up with her or what her peers remember of growing up with her. Thomas also, um, he ensured that Megan was very well taken care of and her classmates or former classmates, rather the ones that she went to school with her peers spoke of how much Thomas would spoil Megan and he would never deprive her of anything that she wanted. If she wanted it, she got it. I want it. I got it. You like my hair? She thinks just bought it. So, so much so he spoiled her so much that he even invested in professional lighting for her school productions after she joined the theater, the school, the local or not the local, the school theater. He even got a professional headshot or a professional photographer to get headshots done for her so that she had those so that she could pitch herself. She very much wanted to be famous. She loved glamour. She was enamored by celebrity. And Thomas said that he was willing to do everything he could to help her achieve her dreams. She had big dreams and he was like, sweetie, I can help you get there. I work in this world. Let me do what I can. There's one incident um, that he recalls where she was denied a part in the school play. So she demanded that he refuse to help them help the production with lighting for that particular play. But he refused because he's like, no, I'm, I'm a man of my word. I told the school that I was going to provide lighting for their their productions and for their musicals or, or plays or whatever. And he's like, I'm not going to do it just because she's upset that she didn't get the part that she wanted in this particular play. And apparently Megan got so upset that she moved moved out and ended up moving in with her mother out of rebellion because she was upset that her father, she felt her father didn't take her side, which is interesting. Um, very interesting. Um, then we get into chapter three. Remember, we're breaking down the first five chapters. So chapter three is titled College. And she really wanted to go to Princeton, but ultimately didn't get into Princeton. So she ended up going to Northwestern. She knew, uh, she didn't know anybody there, but she figured, 
it was a great school, well connected. Um, I think her dad even tried to get her into Princeton and helped her get into Northwestern using some of his pull and his connections. But so when she went to Northwestern, she ended up joining a, a sorority. That way she can kind of get a shoe in. I believe it was like a twenty thousand dollar fee to get into the sorority or to go to the school. Like it was a very big fee that her father had to pay you know, for her time at Northwestern and he fronted the bill for her. So she became obsessed with this book called The Rules. Apparently her peers remember, um, her peers uh, say that she often, you know, would share the the lessons that she learned from this book. It was called The Rules, Time-Tested Secrets for Capturing the Heart. And it was written for women that were seeking marriage in a very short amount of time, like how to find love, essentially, the secret manifestation. I don't really know what the book is, but it was tips and tricks on how to find a man, hook a man, and get him to put a ring on it. If you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. If you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Uh-oh. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Her father, uh, Char, said, Char McShane on YouTube says her father won an Emmy for his lighting direction and she was 13 years old at the yogurt place. Yeah, right. She's a liar. Yeah, see, I mean, I don't know if that factually checks out. Um, being 13 years old and having to work at this yogurt shop, like it doesn't really seem to add up. Um, but yes, her father was very, very well known for his work, his lighting direction. He was a, a very successful lighting director. Okay. Chap okay. So we're in chapter three. She's at Northwestern. She's obsessed with this book called The Rules. Um, and she was apparently quite good at getting guys. Like she was very good at dating. She was very good at finding and hooking guys. She also started to go by Rachel, which as you'll remember, that was her birth name. Her birth name was Rachel. Her middle name is Megan, even though most people know her as Megan, possibly because of the popularity with the name Rachel at the time Friends was on and, you know, everybody loved Rachel. Everyone was getting the Rachel haircut. So People that went to school with her were like, that's probably why she ended up going by Rachel. Her dad's like, yeah, I don't know why she's never been called Rachel in her life that it's interesting. I do know when you go to school, because my first name is actually Peter and my middle name is Zachary. So, but I always went by Zach or Zachary. So even when I would go to school, my mom would make sure she would sign me up with Zachary before Peter. So I always... Um, I was used to, though, like in high school and in college, you're legally registered under your birth name, your your original birth name, unless you change it. And it doesn't seem like Megan changed it. So it's understandable how college professors and some of them can be dicks. And they were probably like, your name is Rachel. I'm calling you Rachel. And so that's why people just knew her as Rachel. That's a possibility as well. But anyway, eventually she lost interest in theater and she really wanted to pursue a career in film. She wanted to be a film actress. And so she had her father get her a spot on General Hospital because he did lighting for General Hospital. So she's like, I need you to get me a spot. And so she had a very brief role, but it was a speaking role, which ultimately helped her get her SAG card, which meant that she could now uh, be a working actress, a membership that her father also paid for. So even if, because I think somebody in the live chat mentioned something about how they thought that she was primarily raised by her mother and that her father seemed to be absent, even if her father, let's say that is true, it seems like the book describes it being the other way around. Um, so it appears that she that he was at least providing for her, that he was at least, you know, paying for everything. I thought you said biracial. Yes, she was biracial. She was half white and half black. Um, so in interviews, though, Megan suggests that she faced a lot of discrimination in college. And she remembers citing a conversation with a peer where they asked about her parents and her situation at home. And she was like, oh, yeah, my parents are divorced. And th th this particular person said, oh, I'm not surprised to hear that your parents were divorced. And she was kind of like taken aback by that. And so she, you know, describes that as some of the, the discrimination that she faced in college. However, a professor that spoke to the author, um, who's a professor of, a pro professor of African-American theater at the college, doesn't really seem to recall any of that or recall witnessing any of that. However, he does describe Megan as very thoughtful and mindful of prejudice. So she was clearly very aware of that type of stuff. He kind of seemed to give like a very Switzerland answer of like, I'm not going to, you know, not gonna 
say one way or the other. I don't remember seeing any of that. That's not my recollection, but you know, she was very mindful of these things, right? So after school, she hit the pa- she hit the ground running, right? She hit the pavement hard, trying to make it as an actress. She had a lot of small roles here and there, nothing groundbreaking. Same as her boyfriends. She had a lot of guys that she had that were kind of in the rotation, but nothing ever really stuck until she ended up meeting film producer Trevor Engelson. And Trevor's a cutie. Um, he does kind of resemble Harry, Prince Harry a bit, but they were like a true power couple, right? She's like this beautiful actress. He's this film producer that's successful. Her acting career wasn't really going anywhere. She'd audition and she'd keep getting turned down, but you know, it was nice to be his arm candy, right? He was proud to parade her around and to show her off as his beautiful actress wife. Or well, at, the, at this point, girlfriend, Spoiler, they end up getting married later. But anyway, her acting career, like I said, it wasn't really going anywhere. Eventually, though, she got a gig on Howie Mandel's Deal or No Deal. Remember, she was one of the briefcase girls. She's like, ta-da. So her father told her at the time, she was kind of like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this. And he's like, listen, sweetie, it's great exposure. Somebody's going to see you. This could lead to an opportunity. It's camera time. It's time around producers. It's time around people in this industry that this could be, you know, a really good opportunity for you to get at least be seen. And she's like, but it's so humiliating. And he's like, well, this is the industry you chose to go into. So you either like it or you don't like it. You got to prop up. If you're going to be a a briefcase holder, then you better open that briefcase. Like nobody's ever opened that briefcase before. Okay. You go, Megan. I was like, you go girl, you go Glenn Coco. And so she stuck with the, she stuck with the deal. She decided to take the deal and pass on the no deal. And so she was doing it. Great exposure for her, right? Because it's probably one of her top three acting credit or top three entertainment credits, um, aside from marrying a prince. But um, life with with Trevor was good, right? She didn't really need to work very hard because he took care of her. He provided for her. She later wrote, however, of her acting career that it was really hard for her to book a role because she was too mixed for the white roles and she was too light for the black roles. So it would often leave her in this struggle of being somewhere in the middle where people didn't really know where to place her because they didn't really understand her ethnicity. Her father says he was surprised at how much um, she now claims to have faced racism growing up because he says it never really came up for her as a young girl outside at the time that she mentioned having to check or having to struggle between checking the Caucasian box and the black box, there aren't many instances that he can recall of her coming to him and bringing up these instances where she felt like she was uh, facing discrimination or racism in any sort of way. Her mother also kind of echoes that same sentiment of being like, I don't really remember her ever talking about this stuff growing up. I don't ever her really remember because like obviously her mother did grow up experiencing some of these things. She says that that was a lot less once she kind of got older and they were in a different income bracket and they lived in a different part of Los Angeles. Um, It seems that that kind of changed, but it is interesting because eventually we'll get into the Oprah interview, but here we are now. Rosa, who are you? Uh, Hi, my name is Zach Peter. Nice to meet you. You can find me on Bumble. Um, So she said that uh, people struggled with where to cast her because, you know, she was, like I said, not white enough, not black enough. They didn't know like where she would actually fit. Um, and then we dive into Suits, which is her pro- her most prominent acting role today, actually. Um, she Her agent at the time claims that he didn't even realize that Megan was a mix of mixed race at the time that she was cast in the show's pilot. He just knew that she earned that role based off of her acting chops that, you know, she shined in that role of that specific character. And that's what got her the role of, you know, I believe the character's name was also Rachel, um, which is interesting because that was technically her birth first name. But he was like, listen, she earned that, that role all on her own. It wasn't a role that was cast as somebody that was ethnically ambiguous. It wasn't somebody that was cast as someone that was white or black. It was a very specific type of character. And she was able to deliver on that character. And he's like, and she was phenomenal about that. But he doesn't think that her race or um, her look necessarily helped her. Rachel Zane. Yes, thank you, Joe Mendoza. Her character's name was Rachel Zane. So I don't believe, or he doesn't believe that 
her race or the color of her skin had any impact on her landing that role or not landing that role. So the show ended up getting picked up. It was set to film in Toronto. She jumped at the opportunity to leave Los Angeles and move out on her own and be a Destiny's Child independent woman. And she left Trevor in the dust. I mean, they were still together and they had a long distance relationship, but she left him here to work in Los Angeles. She went to go work in Toronto. Then we get into chapter four and chapter four is titled Suits. And as you guessed, we will be diving into her role as Rachel Zane on Suits. So after she landed Suits, she had money, honey. She had money. She had status. She was coming on up. She was living her best life out in Toronto. And this ultimately ended up hurting her relationship with her father because he describes it like once she was able to kind of provide for herself and be on her own, that she no longer needed him. And he kind of felt like she no longer needed him. And I believe the most they had was they would have like one phone call a week, which I think seems generous to even be able to maintain one phone call a week. Because like, once you get older, once you do get, you know, your first big job or whatever, you do kind of end up not prioritizing your family as much like you know you are independent and you're on your own and family doesn't appear to be as much of a priority and i think you know when you're in hollywood you know the ego can kind of get big but you know ultimately he says that he felt like she didn't need her and he kind of left her in the dust so she and trevor kept their relationship strong even though it was long distance he ended up in, uh, proposing to her then it was time for them to plan their wedding Thomas, her father, gave her $20,000 to help them pay for the wedding. He's like, it's not that they asked for it. Or he's like, I don't even know if they really needed it. I just wanted to pay for it. It was my daughter. It was her wedding. And like, it's such an important, like, I can provide for it. So why wouldn't I provide for it? Right. So her cast members did attend. And she was especially close to her cast member, Patrick Adams. Joe Mendoza, do you remember the character that Patrick Adams played? So apparently there was like rumors that Patrick and Megan kind of were very friendly on set, that they may have possibly had a little something, something. Patrick denies this. Um, Megan never seems to confirm it either. So it, it's just kind of like alluded to and speculated, but there's never ever any proof that they were commingling of their assets together while she was married to Trevor. But interestingly enough, in a speech the night before their wedding, Trevor vowed to, he made a proclamation where he vowed to give Megan the family home that she never had growing up and this life that she'd always aspired to have, but never actually got. And that's when her dad, Thomas, and her mom, Doria, were like flabbergasted as both her mother and her father gave her a solid upbringing with anything that she could have ever asked for. And they kind of looked at each other like, what? And Thomas says, like, our jaws were dropped because we don't think we, we didn't. Oop. There we go. Sorry. A little thingy on my eye on the Instagram. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, the My eye ended up getting fucked up in the in the filter. But um, so anyway, they were flabbergasted. They were not, they didn't love this miscategor miscategorization of what her upbringing was or whatever she told Trevor that her upbringing was. So apparently Trevor's family was also not very fond of Megan and they were not the biggest fans. They, I don't think they were, you know, actively watching Suits every week, but Another interesting thing is that she didn't allow any photos to be taken at the wedding. Um, her father did sneak a couple of pictures. He's like, listen, this is my daughter's wedding. I'm going to sneak a pic. Okay. So he took a couple of pictures on his phone. Patrick Adams is married to actress Troy and Belisario. Ooh, she's from Pretty Little Liars. She played Spencer. I like Troy and, Be uh, yeah, Tro Troy and Belisario. I liked her. I enjoyed her in Pretty Little Liars. I didn't know that that was his current wife. Interesting. So, like I said, she didn't want any photos taken. He snuck a few. But even the actual wedding video that was shot professionally at the wedding, she allegedly destroyed that afterwards. Like, she wanted no evidence of there really being this, of this marriage ever really existing, which I find kind of interesting. But Trevor worked really hard to make their marriage work. Um the effort didn't appear to be reciprocated from Megan's side. Megan began to embody this ambitious character, 
that was very similar to her character, Rachel, Rachel Zane. So interesting that people started to describe her as, as becoming this type of person who was very young, very ambitious, very driven, very direct, you know, and it seemed that, Me that Megan started to embody that as well. Her friend said that fame really went to her head when the height of suits was kind of at having its moment. But even Trevor noticed how much she had changed when she would return to Los Angeles. Trevor says that he wanted kids, but she really wanted to focus on her career and she wasn't interested in starting a family. And so instead of having kids, she decided she wanted to adopt a dog a dog that already happened to be assigned another family and was in the process of going to that family until Megan was like, nope. So she went on social media and she asked her followers to help her. And so people were emailing the shelter to help her make sure that she got this particular dog that she wanted. And she ultimately achieved that and then posted about it on Instagram where she very interestingly thanked Ellen, which people said felt like she was trying to just do a name drop where she's like, Oh my God, thank you, Ellen, for introducing me to this dog. He's the best ever. And Ellen was like, I don't know her. So I guess Ellen knows her now, right? Cause she's married to a prince, but Megan began earning more and more money on suits. And eventually she was earning up to $75,000 per episode, 75,000 per episode. Actually, it's unclear if that was 75,000 US dollars or 75,000 pounds, because I do know the book is written by a British author based in, in Great Britain. So I would assume, and there are mentions where I caught him saying pounds. So it's unclear when he says 75,000 in the book, whether or not that's, I would assume that's British pounds. But Trevor tried to maintain his career as a producer here in LA while also trying to support her as an actress over in Toronto. And then he says one day he received a package in the mail. And inside that envelope, to his surprise, it was Megan's engagement ring and Megan's wedding ring. And she was done. She was done with the relationship. She didn't want to be married to him anymore. They were only married for 15 months. And her friends described it as Trevor was like out of sight, out of mind to her. Like he, she, he wasn't physically there with her in Toronto. So she couldn't really be bothered by him other than the times that they'd scheduled to kind of stay in touch. But they say that when she is done with you, she's done. She shuts down. She moves on. Friends describe her as very calculating with her relationships with people. Her father, also blindsided by the news of her leaving Trevor, knew that Megan was married to the business more than she was ever really married to Trevor. And he's like, I see it all the time. When people are in this business, they get so caught up in their career that they forget the people around them, right? And it seems like that was what was happening with with Megan. Doria, however, claims that Megan was treated poorly by Trevor, but that was what she believed, uh, or that's what Megan was telling her. And as we know, with claims of like her upbringing, like what she told Trevor about her childhood, didn't seem to check out with what her mother and her father remember from her childhood. So her father seems a little skeptical. He's like, I know she was telling Doria that, you know, Trevor wasn't so great of a guy. But I guess there were there were rumors that they were likely cheating on each other. So I'm assuming that that's what's being alluded to. Thomas just thinks that she outgrew him and no longer needed him the same way she no longer needed her father. So, but there were rumors that they were cheating on each other. There were rumors that she was cheating with this Adams dude, who I guess is now married to Troy and Belisario. So, whether they were cheating on each other or not is still up in the air. It was speculation, but I mean, I would understand how you know there may be a little fling a ding ding when you're separated and you're having this long distance relationship. But the divorce was swift. They, she wanted it. He was like, fine, I'm not going to fight you on anything. It was a very smooth and quick divorce. So it wasn't long or dragged out or contentious. And now that she was free of her family and free of her husband and now seemingly free of her struggle in Hollywood, she was ready to really reinvent herself and become the next level of famous actress that she was ready to be. So this is where we get into chapter five and chapter five, very short. Chapter five is titled Manhunt, and it basically says that she hired Sunshine Sachs, which is a crisis management PR firm. She was paying them around 7000 per month. Unfortunately, the press just wasn't all that interested in her. Um, so they weren't, she wasn't getting a lot of press. So even though Sunshine Sachs was cashed in their paychecks and they were trying to pitch her to all these different things and pitch her to all these different publications, they didn't really care to 
work with her. And I think she got like a courtesy mention in the Daily Mail, but like didn't really get anything beyond that because nobody really knew who she was outside of Suits. But she also apparently has her eyes set on landing a British man. She wanted to make sure she landed, she landed herself a ginger Brit, which is interesting that people say that this was something that she was, I guess that's why they call this chapter Manhunt. This was something that she was interested in and something that she put her eye on was finding herself a ginger Brit. And ultimately she ended up landing herself a ginger Brit. And that is the end of the five, the summary of those first five chapters for our book club. I am very curious what you guys think though. Like, what are your thoughts of these five chapters, but specifically like, what are your thoughts about the people that are giving these stories? Cause I was kind of like, it's kind of interesting. Like if one of her parents was interviewed in the book, I would be like, okay, maybe that parent is a little sketchy, but the fact that both of her parents are interviewed in the book and friends and former teachers and former colleagues and her former agent, they all come out and none of them seem to corroborate any of the stories that she's kind of put up, put out there about, you know, any struggles that she's faced or oppression that she's faced. Um, not to say that it's not real and not to say that maybe they just didn't have a different recollection of things, but I'll try to adjust my shirt. Um, but I'm curious what you guys think. I mean, is it salacious that people reveal things about famous people that they used to know, right? Everyone's like, oh, I used to go to school with them. I used to be his cousin. Oh my God, he owes me money. Do you believe them? I guess is the question of the night. And I will go through some of your comments. Um, Marcella says, we as children view our experiences very different as our parents do. Exactly. Like the TikTok trend to me was very traumatic to you was just a Wednesday. Exactly. Everybody remembers things differently, right? Just like Jenny McCarthy, when we had her on the podcast and she was like, listen, you know, there are times where I will share some of my stories publicly and my sisters will be like, what house were you raised in? I don't remember that ever happening. And how, even though they were all raised in the same house, they have very different recollections of what they remember happening. However, the interesting thing though, to me though, is that it's not just her parents that are saying these things. Like her parents can, I mean, there are things that like, to me, the riot thing, right? That to me, I, I, I think I really believe her father because he's like, listen, we were not physically in Los Angeles at this time. There's no way this story could be true. It's one thing to be like, oh, you know, I didn't feel as supported by my parents. That could be true because that's a little more subjective, right? But saying that you remember witnessing men with guns and rifles and you remember seeing people break into windows and put things into bags as they were looting. I witnessed those things here in downtown during the George Floyd riots. I remember looking outside my window and seeing all of that happen. And I, you know, it's not a fun thing to be witnessing. You know, it's very, it can affect you in a lot of different ways. I can only imagine how that would affect a child. Um, but I also don't believe she lived anywhere near or went to school anywhere near where she would be able to witness something like that actually happening. And both her father and her mother are just like, geographically, this doesn't check out. Um, you know, just there's no factual evidence that this is true. Like, there's no way she saw a charred tree in front of our house because there was no charred tree. She saw that on the news. That's what I was thinking, Kung Pao Kitty. Oh. The fun name. Um, that's what I was thinking is she probably saw these visuals on the news later on and maybe just believed or convinced herself. I think the argument in the book is that she was lying about these things to craft a narrative to gain more sympathy from people and to kind of position her as some sort of victim in a lot of things that she only tells these stories when they're convenient to her. Um, so that's definitely a sentiment that's echoed throughout the book. So I always try to take everything with a grain of salt, but it is interesting though, that you have somebody like her former agent. That's like, I didn't even know that she was mixed when I first took her on as a client. Um, I am reader one says drama queen who creates her own stories to get the type of attention she seeks. That definitely appears to be the point that they try to make in the book is she was very much driven for attention. She was driven for drama. Um, the author is very good at these sort of, you know, exposés. Um, doesn't mean we have to like it, right? Like I 
feel like, you know, when I'm displaying the details about like a Girardi legal case, right? People may not always like the details. They may not know, always like the facts of the case, but that doesn't mean that they're not true. Um, isn't it just weird that Kate has said before that she knew she'd marry Prince William and now people say Meghan wanted to be a celebrity? I'm pretty sure these girls did or these women did set their eyes set on. Listen, you don't just happen to walk into a bar and meet Prince Harry and then happen to marry him. Same thing with Prince William. I think there has to be like an intention, right? The circle that these men or are in, the circle that the royals are in is not an easy circle to penetrate, right? Again, you're not running into them at some dive bar down the street. So I think for me, it's, you know, there has to be some sort of conscious intention in order to find yourself in a circle that would be connected to them and then ultimately kind of have some sort of, you know, direct correlation to them, right? Um, Maria says she also lied about the British tabloids calling her kids the N-word. It never happened. She lies a lot. Okay, so I did hear about this as well. And I, I my understanding is that I don't, believe you can like print that word you can't just print the n word as like a headline or even in a story that's not something that you can necessarily publish i think even the you know lower national inquirer style rags i mean perez hilton who's probably considered you know a little lower on the ranking here in in like hollywood land it's not like an us weekly or people or you know definitely not like a variety or hollywood reporter um None of like even the lower chains even do that podcast. Like we're considered bottom of the barrel and we don't even do stuff like that. We don't even use terms like that. We would be flagged on YouTube or on a podcast if we did something like that. So that story also to me seems very far fetched. But then you also hear like where she was saying, oh, my children weren't given, you know, Archie wasn't given a title in the royal family. And then you find out that, well, the rules are you have to actually be, um, you know, either the descendant or the grandchild of the person that is in line to the throne or is in the throne. So now that King Arthur the third, now that he went from prince to King Arthur, now Archie and Lilibet get titles. Should they, you know, I think that's where things are a little murky too, because Meghan and Harry, we know have now left the royal family and they're like, we peaced out, we've resigned. Um, and now people are like, well, technically by birth, they should be entitled to these things. But who knows if they actually are. So yeah, Maria, that was an interesting point where I did hear that she made that accusation. I couldn't find that happening anywhere. Um, I couldn't find any actual tabloids that called her children the N-word. Um, King Arthur, where's the sword, girl? <laughs> oh, did I say King Arthur? I meant to say King Charles. Yes, Sarah Bahu, who is a member. And Annika, thank you, Annika. Now they have titles. Yes, Annika. Yes, now they have titles. Sarah Bahu says, smash the like button. Woo, woo. And hit that bell button so you always get those notifications. You always want to make sure you're ready when the tea gets built fresh hot. Like I said, we'll be going live this Thursday. And then we'll do our first members only after party immediately after that. So get ready. I told you guys to vote. So if you are a member, you do have an opportunity to vote for what you want the members only after party to be about. I came up with three topics. One was the worst celebrity that I've ever worked with. Two was how I ended up working for Jenny McCarthy. And three was crazy stories from being on tour with new kids on the block. So if you are a member, you can vote in that poll right now and get ready because this Thursday we will go live. We'll do a live stream and it sounds like it'll be fun for members only up on YouTube, youtube.com slash just plain sack. But yes, smash the like button if you're watching this right now, guys. Smash it, smash it, smash it. Smack it, smack it, smack that all on the floor. Smack that. Give me some more. Smack that so you get sore. Smack that. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you, Linda. Okay, what else are you guys saying? Kate was in the circle, though she, even though she was a commoner. Yeah, but like there has to be like an intention, right? Well, go vote, Annika. Um, go vote, girl. Let's see, what else? Uh, why is the author sleazy? He's a bearerist barrister which means that he has to have impeccable character. I don't know what that is. I'm just learning about the royal family. Again, I'm just a dumb blonde American that's now learning about all this stuff. So when you do have terms, I would prefer non-subjective um, 
definitions. Actually, I will Google this myself. What is it? A bear barrister? Well, I mean, he seems pretty. He's written several books. I mean, I don't. My understanding of him is that he seems to be well. He seems to be credible. He doesn't seem to be the most liked journalist, but he seems to be very credible. Oh, okay, he's a lawyer entitled to practice as an advocate, particularly in the higher courts. Interesting. A barrister. Okay. I believe they're trying to do that here in, in California. Like they're trying to allow like everyday people or businessmen an opportunity to practice law. A barrister is a British lawyer. Got it. Thank you guys. Yes, yes, yes. Barrister means lawyer. Yes. Lost. I heard the royal account updated everyone's title, but Harry and Meghan's kids. Yes, but I believe that that was because, thank you, Adam. I believe that that was because they have decided to resign from the church. And so that's why, and it, it's currently like, they're not the only ones that it's, it's the references on the website, right? Because um, William and Kate's children, they've been updated on the website, but the monarch has said that that's only because they, it was, it, it was made official. It was like an official announcement and there hasn't been an official announcement made yet about Harry and Meghan's kids. Um, I believe had they not resigned from the royal family that their kids would have now gotten those titles just as uh, Prince William and Kate Middleton's kids did. I watched the cheesy Lifetime movie. Oh, no, you should know better than to watch Lifetime movies. Megan was trying to get them canceled. She forgets the only that only in America we cancel people. Interesting. King Charles. Not happy with King Charles. Why is why are we not happy with King Charles? Was he one of the ones that was doing the bad things? Who was the one? Which was the prince? Was it Prince Charles? Was that Prince Charles? Was he the Jeffrey Epstein one? Oh, my God. Y'all, I might be tripping. Listen, I've had a long content week. I'm just catching up on the Royals. I'm trying to do a crash course. Um, I don't see the link to join membership. Um, If it's not at the bottom of this screen, then you can go. Sometimes you have to go on the... Um, on the desktop version but here i'll post a link to it let me post a link that way you can click the link directly i'll post it in the live chat that way you have it and you can join right now so if anybody hasn't joined yet there you go click the link it should take you directly to be able to join. Oh, Andrew. Andrew was the was the friend. Yes, the Epstein friend. That's what I thought. I was like, it wasn't Prince Charles. But I mean, who knows? Maybe Prince Charles was into some shit too, right? You never know. Aloha. Um, I think it was Harry. I would have felt I would feel a way about Diana's death. Charles was horrible to Princess Diana, though. Oh, because that's their dad. Duh. Okay, sorry. The blonde moments are clicking together. Prince Charles, who's now King Charles III, was married to Princess Diana, right? This is Harry and William's father. And that's why they're now next in line for the throne, because they're his kids. But I believe all... I don't know. Prince Andrew was the one tied to that. That means they had to pay Virginia all the money. Yes. Um, are you an Anglophile storm? What is an Anglophile? The question is, will there be an announcement? Probably not. Right, Joe. I don't think that there will be an announcement. I don't think they will give the kids an official title. I think they're kind of pissed at them. I mean, wouldn't you be pissed too if like your son and his new wife like went out and trashed the, the family and, you know, made such big wild accusations? I mean, if the accusations are true, then I get that, you know, that's a really big thing in a really big statement but it's like you know then you're over here back in back in England doing press op, photo ops for the queen's passing like i don't know i think it's all weird family dynamics are weird where's the documentary with oprah and harry and meghan i don't know if that's still going to happen <laughs> i think oprah's like ooh i need to back away from this one i think she said something recently too about how the queen's passing could now be like a, an opening for them to repair their relationship with the royal family. And a lot of people are like, whoa, Oprah, hold up. What do you think you're talking about? Who do you think you are? 
Oprah. And she's like, yeah, I'm Oprah, bitch. I recommend watching The Crown on Netflix. Lots of dirt in it. I watched, I believe, the first two seasons of The Crown. I used to like The Crown. I haven't seen, oh, because they have the Diana season and stuff too. Interesting. Yes, Charles and Camila always were in the poor, what, were in love. Poor Diana was just a pawn for fresh blood in the bloodline. Diana was very well loved and well liked. It's interesting though, because at the Queen's funeral, Meghan Markle was wearing an outfit that was inspired by Princess Diana's outfit, which I found very interesting, right? Because I don't believe the Queen was a big fan of Princess Diana. So the fact that Meghan would attend her her um, funeral wearing something inspired by Princess Diana, I thought was was definitely a tabloid moment, right? We wanted to make these comparisons. We wanted to make sure, like when somebody dresses, somebody um, in the presidential running dresses up as like Jackie O, didn't like Melania Trump try to dress up as, as Jackie O one time. Um, and then people were making those comparisons. It's like, those are very deliberate decisions, right? The fashion that you wear to these things are very heavily vetted and are approved by and, and reviewed by several people. That, that was clearly a moment. Clearly. I heard the crown is very historically accurate. Don't know for sure. Anyone know? I've heard the same thing. I didn't go into it thinking that it was, but I did hear the same thing, that it, it was pretty accurate to what was going on, and that's part of why the royals were uh, not happy with it because it wasn't just like a lot of Hollywood made-up stuff. It was a lot more... Um, based off of you know, things that they had found based off of like interviewing people very similar to like this book. I hope we do uh, the crown Harry and Meghan. That would be a good crown season. That would be a good season of the crown. Let's do Meghan Markle. Let's get it. London is on my bucket list. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm so glad you're doing this book review. Yes. So we'll be here every Tuesday book review um, or book club rather. And we'll be reviewing it, summarizing it, going over it, doing the damn thing. And talking about it here every Tuesday. If you want to join, join in on YouTube or we go live on Instagram as well. The two creators of the crown used to be common communists. Maybe we should do that, right? Like a video on YouTube where we break down like all the terms and like a map of the royal family and like the hierarchy of the royal family and what all of these terms are. I think that would be fun. I want to learn about all this stuff. If I'm going to be reading this book that I think it would be fun to learn together, breaking down the royal line of succession. What? Like it's hard. <laughs> Hi, end up. Okay. Any other closing thoughts or questions about all of this guys? So anti-monarchists. Thanks, Mallory. Happy Tuesday, Alicia. Woo -woo. I wish that I could be Team Megan. However, she comes off very inauthentic and trying to act as if she was the new Diana. Yeah, I don't think I would consider her the new Diana. I think she would like to lean into that role and be like, I was treated the way Diana was treated. I, I think she would like that. I mean, it definitely sounds like she loves press. She loves drama. She was very attention-seeking. Fame hungry is how she's described as in the book. It also seems that a lot of people in England don't seem to like her very much. It seems like only we as Americans have kind of idolized her in this interesting way. And listen, her fashion game, you know, she's a beautiful woman. Her fashion is very much on point. But I, I just, you guys could do some help with understanding the royal family. Well, that's what I'm here for. The Dumb Blondes American Guide to Understanding the Royals. Not all Americans like her. I believe more and more Americans are starting to not, or they're starting to see other sides of her. From what I've seen, the more I learn about her, the more it seems like she is a liar. You know, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It seems like she definitely likes to play these things up. It's too late for the Sussexes. They're finished. Ooh, or what? Or what? Sounds like they're finished. They done, honey. We are done with them. Over it. Okay. Any other closing thoughts, feelings, vibes? Her podcast doesn't help. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Not She was paid, what, $800 million to do her podcast? And she has 28 people 
running her podcast. She's 28. I heard that on Heather McDonald. 28 people running her podcast. Who is this bitch coming up in here trying to block user? Boom. Trying to spam our live chat. No, thank you. I honestly forgot all about her. Hi, Zach. Well done per usual. Thank you, Miss Loopy Lori. All right, guys. Shall we wrap? Jacques breaks Jacques breaks it down his podcast, and it's very funny. I love Jacques. I was actually thinking of doing a, a book club collaboration with Jacques. Maybe when we finish the book, him and I will do something together for a book club. Love you, Zach. You bring us such joy. Thank you, Margie's mom. I got some like really mean uh, Apple podcast reviews where people were saying that I have a big attitude and I'm insufferable and they can't listen to me anymore. And I was kind of like, well, that's, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm me and all I can be is me, you know? It's all I know how to be is me. Um, sometimes I have good days, sometimes I have bad days. I just love that you know, other people on the internet can like rip people apart and be nasty and mean and vile. And if I have a moment where I clap back at a bitch or, I, you know, get a little big on my britches that I'm then, you know. All right, guys. Well, I love you. I appreciate you. Thanks for joining on in with Bravo Book Club this week. We'll be back Tuesday, next Tuesday and every other Tuesday. We'll be we breaking down the next five chapters next week. So I will talk to you guys soon. Love you, mean it. Bye. Um, okay. Thank you guys for watching on YouTube. Smash the like button on your way out. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. If you want to join members only, let's join. Vlogs, tea, after party live streams, all good stuff to come. Lots of good content to come. So Get ready for it. I love you guys. I appreciate you. If you want to leave me a good review on Apple Podcasts, hashtag no filter with Zach Peter, I would appreciate that. I would love that if you did that. Um, so thank you. I hope you guys have a wonderful night. I'm going to go make me some popcorn and uh, maybe catch up on that Atlanta reunion. Oh my God. By the way, I saw this week's episode of Real Houses of Beverly Hills. It's actually really good. I like it. I enjoy it. The end, I was like, ooh, so get ready for it. All right. Love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye. 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 Bye.